At the end of the western chapter, the villain Odeo turns into a horse and runs off. To those not familiar with the Battle of Little Bighorn, this probably won't make a lot of sense. This famous battle was one of the most decisive victories for the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes, fighting against the U.S. Army during the Sioux Wars of 1876. In this battle, the Native American tribes defeated Custer's 7th Cavalry by a pretty wide margin, wiping out almost all the 7th Cavalry. Anecdotally, it was said that the only survivor was Custer's horse. So, with all that being said, Odeo is essentially the spirit of that devastating battle manifested in physical form as a horse. I wanted to point out something that may be obvious to people over 30, but maybe not so much to younger viewers. The modern era revolves around a professional wrestling-themed boss gauntlet. In the 90s, professional wrestling was very popular in both Japan and America. Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Undertaker, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, you've probably heard of these guys. Fighting games like Mike Tyson's Punch-Out and Street Fighter were also in high demand. In fact, Street Fighter 2 was the most popular arcade game at the time, and the Street Fighter movie even came out just two months after Live Alive. So, when this game was originally made for the Super Famicom in 1994, what they considered the modern era was just that, 1994. So if you're wondering why Masaru is fighting people instead of dabbing on TikTok, that's why. Hashtag I'm a dad, leave me alone. The prisoner in the Twilight of Edo chapter is revealed at the end of the story to be Sakamoto Ryoma, an important real-life historical figure. Sakamoto was a vocal opponent of the Tokugawa Shogunate, and was an imperial loyalist who became sort of a folk hero for those in Japan that were against aggressive westernization and those who wanted Japan to stay isolated. Also interestingly, Ryoma was killed in 1867, and since we know that the Western Era takes place shortly after the Battle of Little Bighorn, that means Twilight of Edo and the Western Era are only about a decade apart from each other. During Masaru's battle on the beach with Jackie Lokea, you can learn his ultimate technique, the World Breaker. Just bind both of Lokea's arms, and he'll eventually use the technique to break free. Once you're hit with this move, you'll learn it. This move will definitely come in handy if you take Masaru with you into the endgame. We've already addressed the King Mammoth's secret boss in the previous Easter Eggs video, which I'll link to at the end of this video, but I want to talk about what you get for defeating him. As one of the hardest bosses in the game, surely you'll get something amazing as a reward, like a sweet sword, or a powerful spear, or a magic... shoe, or something. But no, you don't get any of that. You get a soda can. It's not even a given, it's a random drop, so you're not guaranteed to get it, which was the case when I played this game and tried to get footage of it. So what's so special about a soda can? Well, you could use it as a weapon in battle. Look at this stupid thing, what's this gonna do? Holy shit! In Twilight of Edo, in the Path of Shattered Lanterns, you could access a room using the storage key. Heading south, you'll hear a click. Keep going, and after hearing a second click, go back north and back to the room you entered from. There's a sword on the wall. Try to take it, and a vengeful spirit called the Bloodthirsty Samurai will appear and challenge you. This is one of the hardest secret bosses in the game, and a samurai could easily defeat you in one hit, so keep your distance. After defeating him, you'll get the legendary sword, the Muramasa, which is well worth your trouble. Lord Awama is another optional boss fight within the Twilight of Edo chapter. Like the Bloodthirsty Samurai, he can be found near the Path of Shattered Lanterns. On the second level of the nearby moat, you'll see a giant black mass swimming around in the water. Approach it, and Lord Awama, a giant koi, will take you on in battle. Fry that fish, and you'll get the useful Sujin Scale accessory. After defeating Miyamoto and the Demon Woman, you'll encounter a maiden in the next room. If you're doing a non-lethal run, or at very least haven't killed any females, the maiden will be so thankful for that very low bar, she'll offer a maid sash item. Cool, free stuff. But if you wait a few moments, she'll come back with an even better gift, the Lacquered Medicine Box, one of the best healing items in the game. After beating the game, you'll get this sweet new tile screen, showing your full party staring off into the sunset. It's a nice little touch. If anyone ever rents my copy of the game from Blockbuster and loads my save, they'll see that I beat the game, and I'm cool. Man, Twilight of Edo really does have a lot of easter eggs, doesn't it? At the very beginning of the mission, if you turn back towards the entrance, you'll be presented with the option to bail out. A Baru Maru will second-guess himself, and the game will give you plenty of opportunities to reconsider. If you desert the mission, you'll get a unique game over sequence. The protagonist will be hunted by his former allies, and eventually they catch up with him. You'll get one last battle, and even if you win, well, let's just say you don't exactly get a comfy retirement. An easy to miss running gag in Live Alive is the misadventures of the Wanabi family. In each era, a father and son experience a series of unfortunate events. In the prehistoric era, a father uses his body as a bridge so that his son could cross a giant hole in the ground. The son successfully makes it across, only for the dad to fall down the hole. Watanabe is killed by Straybao in the tournament, leaving his son to grieve his death. In the Imperial China era, the son, 
Wantainabe, challenges several members of the Indomitable Fist to avenge his father's off-screen death. He charges up for a special move, and it doesn't work so well. In the Twilight of Edo chapter, a father and son ninja are sneaking in the attic of a retainer to steal from his treasure chest. The retainer hears them sneaking about and stabs the father. In the Wild West era, the father and son arrive in town after wandering the desert for several days. They rejoice that they finally found civilization, only for the dad to be shot for no particular reason by one of Odile's men. In the modern era, the dad tosses a can at the Great Aja. The Great Aja, having no chill, presumably murders the dad in front of the entire crowd. In the near future, the Wanabe father is killed prior to the events of the main story, and a son could be found at the orphanage, waiting hopelessly for somebody who's not coming back, like so much Fry's dog. In the distant future, the ship is powered by a main and secondary antenna called Watanabe, so the main being the dad and the secondary being the son. When an explosion destroys the main antenna, the secondary one shuts down, presumably from depression, because that's how technology works, obviously. In the final chapter, you could find the remains of the Watanabes, who were turned to stone after being unlucky enough to come across the Death Prophet. In the Twilight of Edo, you could take two different paths. You could do no kills, or you could do 100 kills, each having its own different ending. If you go the pacifist route, which means killing no humans at all except for mandatory bosses, you'll get rewarded with the Mutsunokami sword, one of the strongest in the game. If you choose the bloody route, you'll soon discover that in order to reach your 100 kill count, you'll need to kill some innocent NPC civilians too. If that puts a bad taste in your mouth, maybe this will help. Killing the retainer will save the Wadanabis in the attic, so murder is the only way to break the endless chain of suffering for the father and son duo. I mean, They'll still die in other eras, but it's something. There's a few storyline differences too. Killing means saving the prisoner earlier rather than later, and each route has a different ending. So ultimately, it's up to you which route sounds better. You could always play it twice and see what you missed. In the final chapter, you'll run into a fair amount of random encounters. If you choose to flee enough times, an ominous voice will threaten you. Run away 100 times, and a Black Panther, called the Death Prophet, will challenge you to battle. Defeat him, and you'll get the Cosmic Chest Mail, which leads us to our next Easter Egg. In the final chapter, there are five secret bosses that all have one piece of super-powered armor that's some of the best equipment in the game. Defeat all five bosses, and you'll have the complete Cosmic Armor set. We already mentioned the Chest Mail. Next is the Cosmic Ring. In the Trial of Instinct, you'll meet a giant koi fish named Lucretius. He's looking for the Golden Top Knot item, which you can find in Masaro's dungeon, the Trial of Power. Give Lucretius the Top Knot, and he'll challenge you to battle. Defeat the giant fish, and he'll give you the Cosmic Ring. After completing Cube's dungeon, the Trial of Wisdom, go back and explore around until you run into a giant mechanical titan named, I'm going to screw this name up, Eureokos. Eureokos. Eurokos. You're a ro he's a robot. Defeat the secret boss, preferably with magic since that's what he's vulnerable to, and he'll give you the Cosmic Helm Armor. In Sundown's dungeon, The Trial of Time, you'll be doing another scavenger hunt, collecting items from treasure chests before eight bells toll. After the eighth bell, you'll fight a strange monster called Jaggedy Jack. Defeat him, and you'll get the Cosmic Gloves. Near the very end of the game, Odio will ask you to step forward, prompting the final battle. However, if you turn and run away, he will use his magic to transport you back to the Void of Darkness. Eventually, a random encounter will pit you against the Headhunter, the final secret boss of the game. He's not easy, arguably the toughest of the secret bosses, but once you defeat him, you'll have the Cosmic Boots, the final piece of the set. Now you'll be able to defeat Odio in style. And to wrap up this video, here's a bunch of small references and easter eggs I thought I'd point out that are probably pretty obvious and don't warrant much explanation. In Latin, Odio's name translates to I Hate, a fitting name for the King of Demons. In the prehistoric era, Pogo shouts AI during, well, his big moment. AI in English is basically just a scream, but in Japanese it's a double meaning. It could be a scream, or it also means love. The villain Obright from the modern era is basically just the bad guy from the Patrick Swayze movie Roadhouse. The final fight is even by a river at dawn. The near future is heavily influenced by futuristic mecha anime like Mobile Suit Gundam and Akira is likely named after the titular Akira. The distant future era is based largely on the movie Alien, from the story starting with a space crew emerging from cryogenic sleep to a mysterious creature killing them off one by one. Captain Square is named after the producers of this game, Square Enix, formerly just Square. Kirk is likely named after Captain Kirk from Star Trek, and Darth is almost certainly named after Darth Vader. And some more Western names I left out of the first video because I thought they were pretty obvious. Sundown is named after the Sundance Kid, Annie after Annie Oakley, and Billy after Billy the Kid, which is appropriate because he's literally a kid named Billy. <sighs> there, I've done it. 
I've covered every conceivable Easter egg that could possibly exist in this game, so I never need to make another one of these videos again. Well, if you like this video, tune in next week for part three of Live Alive Easter Eggs. But seriously, if you really did like this video, please subscribe to West Does Games, where I dig deep into retro and retro-inspired video games. See you next time, and thanks for watching.